Hello, everyone. I'm Lindsay Joseph, the Lynx Program Officer at Resolve to Save Lives, and I'd like to welcome you all to the November Lynx webinar. With the help of our colleagues from PAHO, we are offering simultaneous interpretation into Spanish. Both the English and Spanish webinars are being recorded and will be posted to the Lynx website after the session. The lecture will be around 30 minutes long, followed by a Q&A session. We encourage participants to use the Q&A button to ask questions as opposed to the chat function. During the presentation, participants will be muted, but will have an option to type in questions for the Q&A portion of the presentation. Again, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to linkscommunity.org. I will now hand it over to Dr. Tom Frieden, President and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives, to introduce the topic and speaker for today's webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We have another really exciting presentation for this webinar. Uh, Lynx now extends to more than 80 countries around the world. It's a growing online community for resource sharing for people working in practical ways to prevent cardiovascular disease. It's a collaboration among Resolve to Save Lives, the World Health Organization, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Sodium reduction is an incredibly important intervention. Excess sodium increases blood pressure and the risk of cardiovascular disease. And it is estimated that well over a million lives a year could be saved by reducing sodium intake by 30%. Promotion of salt substitutes is an effective sodium reduction strategy with the potential to make a huge public health impact at a relatively quick pace with a double win of less sodium and more potassium. Today's presenter is Dr. Jaime Miranda, research professor at the Department of Medicine School of Medicine and director of the Cronicas Center for Excellence in Chronic Diseases, both at the Universidad Peruana Cayetano uh, Heredia in Lima, um, and he works to bring together epidemiological and health policy aspects of non-communicable diseases in lower and middle income countries with an emphasis on obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. Dr. Miranda will discuss the effects of low sodium salt substitutes on blood pressure and the findings of a recent very impressive study that some of you may have read about in the media uh, based on a study in Peru. Dr. Miranda, over to you. Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be joining the, the Lynx community everywhere. So good morning, good afternoon, as, and good evening, as, as you said. Um, so this is the title of the study. I'm gonna uh, program to make it on 25 minutes so we can allow sufficient time for conversations. Here are my disclosure of conflict of interest. Uh, on the images, you can see the number of institutions that were involved in the study. Uh, a, a big collaboration that was part of the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases, and it was funded by the NHLBI, the NIH. And uh, you can see there the, the funding that I'm beneficiary from. Next, please. For this community and for this particular group, uh, uh, this is not new. Hypertension is a global health issue, and not only because of its impact on communities, individuals, and households, but entirely on larger societies as well. And we see their impacts uh, in different aspects of the health systems, such as the requirement for chronic care, the requirement to have a sufficient number of people and individuals trained, not necessarily doctors, but uh, a large um, gather of, of people looking after this problem, and then a requirement or a need to think about creatively of touch shifting strategies. Next, please. If I were to show this slide uh, to a community of cardiology, we tend to narrow down and to silo the conversation about hypertension with the specialties. And even if we were to concentrate on a single specialty, let's take uh, cardiology, for example, here's a number of publications spanning 20 years and the message hasn't changed. There are not sufficient doctors to tackle this problem. Next, please. 
If we go back to one of the fundamental uh, concepts of epidemiology and population health, um, Geoffrey Rose uh, put forward this idea that uh, in order to tackle diseases, we could, uh, we could conceive a identification of individuals at high risk, but also we should not forget about the population approaches. These two are not mutually competitive, and certainly the latter one has to deal uh, with the causes of incidence of a given condition. Next. In showing this slide, um, uh, this is from the same publication, he, he puts forward this figure, which is uh, distribution of blood pressure in two different populations, Kenyans, nomads, and London civil servants. And this is a very basic but fundamental graph saying why populations have different distributions. And I think it is important to resonate this question. Why is hypertension absent in Kenyans and common in London? And the answer to that question he raises has to do with the determinants of the population mean. For what distinguishes the two groups is nothing to do with the characteristics of individual. It is rather a shift of the whole distribution a mass influence acting on the population as a whole. And it's these mass influences acting on the population as a, whole with, as a whole that is the spirit of this presentation and this endeavor. Otherwise, if we only look at our alternatives, focusing on individuals at high risk, we will lose ammunition to tackle this global problem. Next, please. Blood pressure matters, and it's important. And this is uh, one, one message that was extracted from these prospective studies collaborations, um, a meta-analysis of more than 1 million adults uh, in different countries. And they say that even at two millimeters mercury, lower usual systolic blood pressure will have about 10% low, lower stroke mortality. So these modest decreases has important and substantial public health gains. Next, please. In here, I'm plotting from the same study, the prospective studies collaboration, I'm plotting the mortality curves, uh, I'm, not, I'm using the, the graphs of the mortality curves of a stroke. And you will see a stroke mortality according to systolic blood pressure and to diastolic blood pressure. And you see in each of the graphs, four lines, which are different age groups. And on the x-axis, you see the levels of blood pressure. You see, for any given level of blood pressure, and for every, any group, age group, as blood pressure increases, mortality also increases. So they argue, and even this, 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 this increase is observed even in the normal ranges of blood pressure. So people not having necessarily hypertension. So for the general normal tendency population, including in this population, um, um, some persistent reductions in average blood pressure should avoid large numbers of premature deaths. And if you were to replicate and go to a regional source, the graphs for, um, for other cardiovascular or ischemic and heart disease, the mortality plot will, be, will look very similar. Next, please. This community is quite familiar with the story about salt. Um, Reducing salt has been linked to improving blood pressure. And here is a number of systematic views, but also increasing and separately and independent of the sodium effect, the increasing of potassium also has been linked to improved levels of blood pressure. Next, please. Yet, if we tell people not to eat salt or not to eat or do it well or not to eat not to do it badly is very difficult just telling people to do so doesn't work well here's a systematic review on what it will take to get people on a good and effective engagement with a change in behavior in salt consumption and it's terribly difficult and certainly it doesn't work telling people to do what is right next please So this is the protocol of the study that I'm going to share with you. You can go and find all the details and the technicalities in this, in this publication. Let's move on. 
Next. Uh, in summary, the, the objective and the design is described here. We wanted to assess the efficacy of a pragmatic intervention using a salt substitution strategy to reduce blood pressure, as well as its impact on the incidence of hypertension at the population level and the emphasis here at the population levels. And the design was using a step wedge cluster trial in Peru. Next page. So this is a map of Peru, South America. Peru, uh, the area that we work is Tumbes, is the border with Ecuador. It's, um, it's on the equatorial line, uh, quite tropical. Uh, the population is around 200,000 people. The le poverty levels in relation to the country is around 25% of the population are poor. And the figures of hypertension prevalent, considering individuals of 35 years and older, uh, was nearly 27%. Next. And also in terms of context, this was our competition. So these are the, the local products of salt. Um, you can see uh, there's, a, there's a much similarity into, into different type of providers. So for us, it was only one competition. We needed to, to go on to replace this, this salt. Next. The participants were drawn from six villages six villages that are semi-rural, some of them working in agricultural or fishing activities. All individuals uh, 18 years old and older were eligible for the study, and we managed to enroll over 90% of them into the study. And certainly by the sign of the study, we excluded people who had a diagnosis of chronic kidney diseases, and also those who were uh, currently on digoxin medication due to heart disease. Next, please. The intervention, uh, we wanted to guarantee the full replacement of salt in the entire village. That's easier to be said than done. What? We had this idea of using a sub substitute. How? We wanted to give it free of charge, but in exchange of regular salt. So people had to do not a financial transaction, but uh, they had to give up something. Uh, where? Uh, we wanted to tackle everywhere, families, small shops, bakeries, community kitchens, food vendors, street vendors, and restaurants. And when it happened between 2014 and 2017. Next, please. These are the outcomes. The study was designed to have a primary article, uh, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. And this was measured every five months, every five months. And using seven runs of measurements, and that's the... Uh, what well, you can afford with this step which type of design where you measure everybody uh, before the randomization and then as village become randomized into the intervention, you measure everybody again. Uh, let's continue, next. The second outcome was the incidence of hypertension using that definition, next. And also we wanted to, to see in some exploratory analysis the changes in levels of sodium and potassium excretion in 24 urine samples. So this was a subsample of participants. Next. And also um, an exploration of the blood pressure levels by hypertension status at baseline and by age groups. Let's move on. Okay, so how do we do this? Up to this point is a protocol, uh, it's a grant awarded, then we need to put it in practice. Move on. Um, so we had uh, we had the benefit of extensive formative research, uh, please. Uh, we had to identify the optimal flavor. For that, before launching the, the study, we introduced a triangle taste test to see at what level people would notice. There has been lots of reports that potassium salt uh, enhanced salts uh, has this metallic flavor. So that will be a very difficult competition. And we figure out the thresholds at when people upon which people will notice uh, that flavor will change. And we decided to go with this combination. We could even go further up to 35% without sacrificing pal palatability. We identified the target audience uh, through interviews at, and focus groups, and it was decided that the target for this strategy had to be women and the community, rather than health facilities or rather than health messages. Uh, next. And we had to develop a product identity. We wanted to come and arrive into these villages and say, okay, hang on, there's this new product, would you like to join us? 
and uh, we had to generate an uh, identity for this new product. Next. And this is a product identity. We gave it a local name. And this was working with a team of social marketing people. Uh, it was a character of a local woman and the packaging has to be transparent. And it came also with a sole container uh, for one kilogram capacity and a screw cap uh, and also a spoon uh, that was given for, for, for using on a day-to-day -day basis. Next, please. Following the concepts on the these pillars of social marketing where they call for this piece, uh, you have to identify a product, a place. Our product was this salt list. The place was uh, door to door. We, we delivered this door to door using a, a network of friends of lists uh, as, as we devised it. The price was an exchange. And so these people, we arrived to the door and say, would you like to take part? And, and people would say, yes, so give us whatever amount of salt you have and we will replace it for you and we will come back to you to, to give you more. And certainly there were some community-wide activities for promotion and campaigns to, to generate this enthusiasm about this new product coming to the villages. Next. Okay, so what are the results? This is the most used slide of my career. So next, please. Next. Here's table one. I'm, I'm going to signal here's four salient characteristics. Uh, next, uh, next, please. The age of the population that took part in the study was very young. So up to a third of the population was uh, between 18 and 29 years old. And these are people that traditionally won't be considered at risk for hypertension or won't be considered as part of intervention studies for reducing blood pressure. Next. In terms of a study village, you see that because of the design, it was a step wedge design. So people were incrementally taking part of the intervention. You see that village A contributed very little to the uh, control arm, but uh, quite a bit, quite a lot to the intervention. That's the, that's the first village that received the intervention. Whereas village F uh, took part in the study more time in the control. So they have more observation contributes more observation periods to the control and less to the intervention. That's the nature of the step wedge uh, class to design. Next, please. In terms of overweight and obese, we can uh, see that um, mm -hmm. people are up to 70% of the population are either overweight or obese. And next, in terms of blood pressures, the starting point of blood pressure levels, systolic blood pressure was 113, um, diastolic was 72, and 18% of the population had or could be considered hypertensive at baseline. Let's move on. So these are the, this is the primary outcome. We see an overall reduction in systolic and diastolic blood pressure in these, in these uh, levels, um, 1.2 for systolic and, and 0.7 for diastolic. These are very modest in line with, with the initial um, um, responses of these population-based uh, approaches. And these, these effects were independent of time, of variations in time and period. So that's also important uh, for, for these type of studies. Next. Uh, when we plot these results by uh, subgroups, uh, uh, you see that the effects appear to be enhanced amongst those who would traditionally be considered high risk. These are people with hypertension, um, people who are older. Uh, the, these modest effects are enhanced. Next. When we explore uh, the cumulative probability of the developing hypertension in the fully adjusted model, we see a reduction of 55% in the probability of developing hypertension. So hypertension incidence was half, and this, uh, this model was adjusted for, for a various of other important factors such as socioeconomic status, um, BMI, and uh, certainly the blood pressure levels. Next. Let's move on to the secondary outcome, which is the urine samples. It was a random subsample of 600 participants, and we see that there was no difference um, in sodium levels at the beginning and at the end, yet there was an 
difference in uh, higher levels of potassium at the end of the study. And for us, this, this was sort of our insurance. How did we know that people were actually using, using the salt substitute? And this is a proof that people did engage into, the, into this intervention. Next, please. What does it mean? Where do we go from here? Next. I remember we had our competition and we had to devise a strategy. We came up with a social marketing type of approach to introduce this new product. And rather than that arriving into villages because of health benefits or health claims, we generated an, a story about this product and people were actually uh, engaged with it and they wanted to, to be part of it. So Salt, salt Lease became part of the community. Next. Remember, I have to, to reuse this, this slide again because it's important that even these modest uh, decreases in blood pressure are meaningful and have meaningful public health impacts. Next. And uh, the learnings of our message is that we were able to demonstrate an effective, pragmatic population-wide strategy with reductions in the whole population blood pressure that translates into higher reductions into in the high risk in the high risk groups i mean those people that were hypertensive at baseline or the older populations and also uh, with a direct implication in the number of people getting a label of potentially a label of hypertensive the reduction in the incidence was important of 55 percent next the messages is um in a world where, where hypertension requires attention, and then even so, once we make the effort of diagnosing it, uh, we have the further problem of non-adherence, non-adherence to medication, uh, we certainly need to look creatively to non-pharmacological interventions at the population level. Uh, our social marketing intervention demonstrated uh, this benefit, but also translating public health gains through shifting the population distribution, I certainly saw clinical and health systems impacts by halving hypertension incident. Um, we argue that switching to low sodium hypertension salt is feasible and it's effective in reducing blood pressure. Next, please. Um, thinking about the future, uh, uh, why not uh, think about these strategies into our daily life activities? Remember, there's an element of adaptation. Uh, you might recall in our the initial slide where we try, when we were trying to find out the original threshold, uh, we said that we could go into further reductions up to 35% of uh, substitution, or substitution of the sodium. So there's room to play there. And, and, but it brings the message of thinking about the potassium and its different sources of potassium uh, in the natural diet as well, and not only focus about the sodium alone. Um, potentially, um, other studies and other settings could have even better results, Consider that our study participants were young, a third of our population were very young, and our baseline levels of blood pressure were 113. And when we contrast this to other settings, um, these baseline levels of, of blood pressure, systolic blood pressure will be higher, therefore the benefits will be, uh, we, you could postulate the benefits will be higher as well. Next. This is uh, the group that I represent. This is the Chronic Center of Excellence in Chronic Diseases. Um, we were based in Peru at the Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia. Uh, these are the values that we've been doing research for the last 10 years under the values of generosity, innovation, integrity, and quality. So with this slide, I want to thank everybody in the team in, in Peru and in different parts of the country. Next. If you want to continue the conversation, I'm happy to be engaged and, uh, um, and answer further questions. And I think I shall stop here. Great. Thank you very much. That was a, a model of clarity and uh, brevity. A lot of information in uh, just 20 minutes. Uh, so we have a lot of time for discussion and questions. And uh, I, I'm going to start this out. Please, again, Lindsay will give the instructions for how to type questions in. And then while we're waiting for... Uh, the questions that come, I'm going to ask a few. So, Lindsay? Yes, uh, just a reminder, you can use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen uh, to type in questions for Dr. Miranda. Um, we prefer that you use the Q&A feature as opposed to the chat function, but we will be checking the chat in case there are questions there. 
So, uh, Dr. Miranda, let me first ask uh, about the, the somewhat confusing directions of both sodium and potassium. What, uh, what your initial and endpoint showed was no uh, decrease in the sodium, but a big increase in the potassium. And I wonder if that could reflect people using more of the low sodium potassium enriched salts. That wouldn't be a result without benefit, but it would be somewhat of a disappointment. So I'm wondering if you can comment on that and if you have any data on actual purchase and use levels of the amounts of sodium that households were using, did that increase, decrease with time? And just as background, uh, there is one theory that suggests that the potassium enriched uh, salts may taste a little less salty, so people may consume a little more of them. So over to you. Very good point. And uh, I, I wish I could have more precise answers. And um, given that it's a, it's a habit that we cannot capture in its entire detail, uh, we can open up uh, the potential number of explanations. And I will tend to agree that, that that's one, one of the, uh, the strongest ones. Yeah, people ended up using more of it, more of the salt. And, and with that, you could say, well, but that doesn't go against the message of reducing the sodium. My, my take on that would be that by, even if they're using more, adding more of these, let's say, of these new product, I think it is the potassium that carries some of the benefits as well. The other message is that there is some adaptation as well. And some, I'd say that over time, people will realize that um, using less may, may be fine as well. Or there's room also for different type of interventions by initially testing this, this concentration and then quickly entering into uh, a more potassium type of, type of uh, supplement. And therefore, even if they use more to get a more sort of the salty effect, um, they will get more potassium. So there is a lot of room there to, to, to discuss. Um, gladly, we had this, this uh, urine um, sample collection so we could monitor that, but it was only made uh, at baseline and at follow-up. Another important and less uh, more of a, a speculation from, from my side and from our team is, is that people steal a lot of uh, additives for cooking. And one of those is the mono, monoglutamate uh, sodium, uh, this, which is quite common in Peru as well. So perhaps that could be the other source of, of, of sodium and therefore the, the no difference in sodium levels um, that, that we observe in the urine. And I stop here. Thank you very much. Um, we have lots of questions coming in, so let me uh, let me uh, uh, go through those, and I'll uh, add in my own as we have time. Um, what do you think might be the challenges of scaling up this intervention to an entire country or region? What do you think might be the response from the public, from authorities, from industry, from the companies uh, that make uh, regular salt? Good point, and thank you, at least for the for the question. Hola. Um, you know, during the, during the execution of the study, we tend to focus the response and to narrow them into single box, but the responses are going to be different. So we engaged with the industry and we heard two different types of signals. One of them is that the salt production for cooking purposes is not the main, the main business of these groups. They produce industrial salt levels and just as a side, I wouldn't say, let's not diminish it, but as a side product, they have these, these um, salts. Uh, and, and they were producing at that time, the, these low sodium, high potassium salt as a, a corporate responsibility type of activity. And they didn't want to increase the share of their market for that particular salt. So the salt industry in particular, I don't see it's a major damage for them because uh, as we understood, the, this salt for cooking uh, is not their main business. They produce salt for, for other industries and large quantities. So that's one. The other one is costs. Uh, and during the engagement of the study, we were able to purchase the cost on, of a given price. And then within the lifetime of the project, we were able to knock down the price up to five times. So I think there's margin there to introduce that. 
certainly in, in, in cultures and societies where cook is important, I think there is benefit and, certain, um, and you could work out the strategies as to how best to get this into people. Ideally, if you give it to me, I, I, will, I will advise for an entire countrywide uh, replacement because, because people adapt. People adapt to it and, um, and it's very safe. Um, and the moment you adapt, that's, that's nature and, and you can continue with it. But certainly I, I appreciate that I may be pushing for too much, uh, but uh, pushing for the wider availability of this will be important. And certainly the, the, the routes for scaling up will have to be different considering the different interests of different people. I think our study has, a, has to be taken from the point of view of pragmatism, that population-wide interventions are doable, are, are effective, and can have substantial public health gain. Great, we have so many questions. What I'd like to do is try to have us uh, ask and have quick, quick uh, kind of a quick round of questions, then we can come back again. So for maybe brief answers, um, how confident do you think we are that the reduced blood pressure was the result of uh, increased potassium or were there other interventions such as treatment with antihypertensives or anything else that might have accounted for the decrease? The, the study was designed to see this population-wide effect. So we're, we're not able to disentangle which one is the, is the main. So uh, I'm afraid I cannot comment on the, whether it was the potassium only or was the treatment availability. Uh, but if there were to be, we have to take this in context. I mean, when you do large intervention, we have to remove our unique or single, single item uh, causing a single change. So I, th I think, again, I go back to the point of by, by switching the entire behavior and, do it, and doing it on a mass scale, uh, you can see still, you can gain and you can see the public health benefits and gains. Um, interestingly, there's a study from Shandong, China, that had a relatively similar approach and a relatively similar impact. And one of the questions that's been asked there, as we would ask you is, do you, do you have information on the level of treatment with antihypertensives over the course of this time period in the population? We do, I mean, this, this has been a question that arose in, in, our, in our studies. We do have uh, the, the treatment information at baseline but not in, in the follow-up. So, so if we work to even, even to do the analysis separated by treatment levels, the results don't change. I see. Um, yeah. Great. So, and then uh, getting to the issue of safety, did you issue, did you have any warning label on the, uh, on the low sodium salt? And uh, do you have uh, any concerns about people who might've had unrecognized kidney disease? That's a very good point, a very good question. And these concerns are, are real. Um, I might take it that we, okay. First of all, on the design of the study, we, we have to be very cautious and conscious about people with chronic kidney disease. And, and that was an observation of the IRB here as well. So, so we decided to exclude people with those conditions. Number two, because of the repeated number of visits, we had like seven contacts of the fieldwork team by measuring blood pressure. They came uh, with their radars wide open to try to capture signals of problems and people did not report problems. Um, and therefore, uh, in, in terms of safety, um, I'd, say, I'd say we are on, on very safe grounds of recommending this intervention. But remember, because the increases in potassium are, are are minimal. I mean, I wouldn't say minimal, but are very low compared to the warnings and the risks that the, particularly the clinical community are familiar with. So yes, we, we, we pay attention to that. We excluded people with a established diagnosis of, of chronic kidney failure, um, but also we were alert during the time as to capture newer uh, symptoms or problems and, and none were reported. And again, I, I suppose this brings back the, the conversation between the community of nephrology, the community of industry, and, and, and to, to think about what levels of uh, potassium in the, the community are, 
are of harm or not. And uh, because I think at training medicine, I also remember having potassium on the box of do not touch or do not get close to it. Um, uh, but for public health and messages, perhaps we need to reconvene and, and, and improve the literacy of, of not only professionals, but also the community about the risks of potassium as well. Thank you. And a uh, quick question about iodine. Was this iodized salt? Uh, yes, absolutely. Because of Peruvian regulations, all salts that are in the market has to have iodine. So these salts have iodine. And let's talk a bit about cost. Um, uh, do you have a sense of uh, what the cost is uh, and how cost sensitive consumers uh, were at the outset and in follow-up? Um, during the, the, the life of, I mean, during the intervention, during the study, uh, cost was not an issue. As, as, as you may remember, we traded it. Um, we, we gave people the low sodium uh, potassium substitute uh, uh, in exchange of, of the current uh, stock of regular salt. And then we came back household by household uh, providing more. So cost for this particular project uh, was not an, an element. So we, we traded it. But I, as I also explained, um, during the lifetime of the project, cost was able to decrease substantially. It is still slightly more, much more expensive than the regular one, but I suppose there's room and margin for if, I mean, in the same way that you, that you purchase mass in volume, uh, American, uh, pharmaceutical drugs, I think in here, if the volume is higher, the cost will, will be reduced. Uh, and let's talk about formulation. You mentioned that up to 35% were uh, was palatable uh, we've we've heard about a difference between kind of basic and advanced formulations of low sodium salts my understanding is that some of the advanced formulations may use proprietary methods to melt and then recrystallize the crystals and that may reduce the metallic taste any perspective on percentage and uh, impact I'm, I'm not familiar with those products. They have not arrived here in the market. And I think we're still in the very basics of testing the, 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 the components. Uh, but if people are improving the metallic state, which is a very, which is a very substantial knocking off of the behavior. Um, so the metallic taste, people decide not to engage with that. But if that is improving, certainly I foresee that people would, would engage easier and, and for longer. Great, and we have a comment from Larry Apple from Hopkins. Uh, first, that it's quite likely that the intervention, if sustained, would lead to even greater blood pressure reductions over time. And second, that there is a technical reason for the null reduction in sodium excretion, that higher variability in sodium excretion compared to potassium excretion will reduce the power to detect a difference in sodium relative to the power to detect a difference in potassium. Uh, thank you, Larry, for that. Uh, Jaime, any comments on that? No, thank you for that. Very supportive. I, I do agree. If, I mean, unfortunately, due to the lifetime of this project, we were only able to be on the field for X amount of time. And ideally, um, I think it lends itself to, to more substantial length of interventions for this type of project and, and, and in different settings as well. As I mentioned, different settings will have different start off points of blood pressure levels, and we could see and we could test um, multiple impacts and a range of effect sizes in different settings with a range of duration of intervention. So I concur entirely with that point. And um, thank you for, for learning. I'm, I'm not a nephrologist, so we've heard also about all the uh, difficulties and the challenges of capturing changes in, in sodium as well over time. So this is another element that uh, help us interpret better our results. So thank you for that, Larry. Thank you. And since you've talked a bit about different settings, uh, we were very interested to see that you also tried this with street vendors and uh, others. There have been a real scarcity of successful models of reducing sodium in restaurants, street vendors. Uh, there are educational models for at-home reduction. There are regulatory models for 
a packaged food reduction, but for the restaurant venue and street food venue, we haven't seen much. So can you tell us anything about uh, acceptance in that venue? Uh, good point. Um, and I, sometimes we tend to, 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 to put forward our research questions or interventions uh, based on where the resistance will be. But in this case, we, we flip the coin. And instead of saying, looking at this as a resistance, we, we turn to it as an opportunity. So people wanted to be part of this, this new product. So our, our intervention was framed around these social marketing campaigns and people uh, in a way was enthused that this new product was arriving into the village rather than the regular ones and, and so on. I go back to the question to, to any of us here in the audience, saying, when was the last time that you changed the pot of your salt at home? And so thinking creatively about this uh, would, would open, uh, op not opportunity, it would open spaces where, where you can introduce and place your new product. As you might remember, we gave people the salt, but also a pot, a clean pot for, for their salt, and they were happy with it. And we're offering that. Um, restaurants and venues, I'd, I'd say they are moved not because of flavor only, but whether or not their customers will, will buy it. And if they, we have another study of salt substitution, no, yes, by reducing salt, not, not introducing potassium, with bakeries and the outcome was sales. And as soon as the bakers looked that the flavor didn't change, that the purchases and the vending volume didn't change, the product of the quality didn't change much, they, they, they engaged with it. So, so my advice of that will be, let's not look at the potential resistance, but let's flip the coin or, or flip the, flip the side of the, the story to look at opportunities. And for restaurants and vendors, I think what moves them is that customers keep buying and customers adapt as well. Thank you. Can we just double back to the question of cost? Uh, a little bit of confusion here. We understand that you initially gave uh, a, a replaced salt for people, but then after that, did they have to purchase from the market? Was that subsidized? What was the relative cost? Oh, right, right. Sorry, sorry for the confusion. No, so during the lifetime of the project, let's say we arrive to your house with Dr. Freeman and say, um, would you like to take part in the study? I would say, oh, yes, I've seen this product coming to the village. I, I'm, I want to be part. So give us whatever regular salt you have in a stock. So if you had two kilograms or half a kilo, we will replace you with that. And then we will come back because we had to do the blood pressure measurements and we will replenish or we will uh, give you more cost free of the new of the of the low sodium low sodium potassium supplement salt, salt. so there was no uh, a, a purchasing mechanism for the participant but they had to ask for more salt from from us from the team and with that we were able to guarantee and sustain the entire replacement so some people would ask by next month, I, can I have one more kilo of salt? Or can I have two more kilos? Or, or my cousin wants some. We, we, we heard the story that people are stacking up uh, some, some of these and sold for, for the future as well. So it was an entire replacement cost free in exchange of your regular salt during the lifetime of the project. So people didn't have to, to purchase it. Uh, okay. And, uh, what was the source of the low sodium salt? Did you have a local industry produce this? Is this something that's going to remain on the market there? Yeah, we had at the beginning we had only one. As uh, it was, it was signaled by one of by Beatriz and Sal. So it's the Nash, it used to be a, a a national company and then became privatized. And those are the ones who told us, uh, uh, you know, we're doing this for social responsibility and we're doing our share of social responsibility as well. So it is available, yes, but in low quantities. And then there was another provider that came into the, into the game, another player. Um, this was a company from Chile that brought the, uh, this low sodium high potassium supplement, uh, well, potassium replacement salts. So we had two, two, two offers and they're still uh, in the market and, and you can buy it. Where, however, the concentration is different. And that's why um, some of the, the potassium and rich salt are 50% potassium, 50% sodium. Uh, how did Liz work out as a marketing device? Is, is, is she still selling salt in, in Peru? 
Well, at least I think, I don't know, we should be patenting it. We want, but then we are researchers and we didn't have, I didn't have a class of administration, business administration. So we are open for advice. Here we are in conversations and as a side project to try to start a new, a new product uh, to try to survive lease. But if anyone wants to jump in and take the idea forward, very happy. They might, we've demonstrated that there is a capacity for a market, that there are benefits and people do engage with it over time. Now, if I understand correctly, you are actually providing all of the salt, not in the stores, but uh, by refilling directly through a social marketing approach. Is that correct? That is correct. We're refilling directly to the house to the point of it, our, our place for the connection was door to door. So are you able then to track consumption at the household level? We could have, and I think we have. I think we have that data of how much salt has people received over time. That's a very good question. I think we do have that data. And do you have a sense of what percent of the salt that households consume was the low sodium salt? Did they switch to that or were they dual users of the low sodium and the regular salt? Um, I, th I wouldn't say that we entirely remove the, the regular salt. Uh, some people may have had the store or, 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 or cheated on us, but because of the mass presence and the mass uh, intervention, I'd say that the majority, I mean, substantial proportion will, will be the consumption of the, of, of the low sodium salt. And for us, this was our backup, our insurance for, to, to argue this is, is the urine samples. Um, that is why also we went and we replaced on the local stores. Uh, remember, we're not talking about big, big cities. We're talking about small shops and small family run uh, vendors, street vendors as well. Uh, therefore, uh, therefore, I, I would argue that the replacement was, um, was pretty substantial. Thank you. Um, and did you get any feedback on taste or acceptability? Uh, any concerns about uh, the metallic taste when it was actually in the field? No, not at all. And I, I've done the study in my household and with some relatives as well. And, and my my own observation, which is very biased, uh, to, by three days people adapt to it. So I invite you to to be also part of the study. You can do it at home, and it, it can it can be a gradual transition, and uh, and then you don't notice it. So we didn't have any complaints. Great. And do you have any sense of whether after the study was over, people continued to use the low sodium salts? No, that's the sad part of the story because uh, this was in the north of Peru and, we, and the procure, procurement of the salt happened in Lima in the capital and we had to move all this, of this salt up there. So we're looking for, for options to make this low sodium salt available. Um, um, so it, Right now, the low sodium, the formulation of 50% sodium, 50% potassium is available in Peru in big supermarkets, in big uh, change of supermarkets, but not in, in small villages. And, and how much more expensive is that in the supermarket than regular salt, if, if you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. I know. As, a, as, a, as a point of purchasing costs, if you go to a supermarket, uh, it used to be few years ago, it used to be 10, 20 soles, let, let's make a 20 soles per half a kilogram. So that's 40 soles per kilogram. Uh, because it was promoted as a healthy sole, 40 soles per kilogram compared to one sole or 150 uh, for, the, for the regular salt, for one kilogram of regular salt. And now it is eight soles, well, in the presentation, eight soles for half a kilo is let's say 16 soles uh, relative to one. And still they're making a margin. So there has been a dramatic decrease from 40 soles to 16 soles in this uh, span of time. Great, thank you. And um, just thinking a bit about uh, scale up, um, has there been any discussion with the government about any means to try to scale up um, the consumption of low sodium uh, salt in Peru? Um, that's a difficult question because uh, <laughs> over the last five years, we've had three presidents, six ministers of health, 
and so on. So I'd, I'd say I, I'm less enthusiastic about scaling up through those avenues. What, what we are trying to put our energies is through the, through the large community of cookers. There's, a, there's this big buzz in Peru about um, the cuisine and the Peruvian food. And those who are kind of the ones promoting that, I, I see that as a more immediate target rather than, than, than government. Because if, if it's a government road, it, it, it will have to be a subsidized approach, which is, which is good and important as well. And, and, and that we've, we've approached some technical agencies, UN uh, technical agencies uh, are related to food, as such as World Food Program or the, or, um, the FAO. Uh, they've heard as well, so so it's on the radar. And scalability is terribly important. I'm very happy to pursue those those conversations as well. Uh, but uh, remember, we have to do uh, the clinical work, the research side, and also the policy and advocacy. And, and our team is quite limited. Thank you. Um, another question: um, What do you think the costs of people going door to door to promote it? Um, is this something that would be scalable? Do you see this as scaled by the market or scaled by a social marketing or health agent approach? What, what do you think are the most promising ways to try to get low sodium salts widely used? Absolutely, I'd say that, remember our, our, our social marketing strategy did involve some, uh, it's not equivalent, but some sort of a community participation. So we identify some key, key uh, leaders of these uh, salt lists, and they were the ones that were our our contact point of information of of uh, talking uh, or expressing or disseminating within the community about the potential benefits of this new salt arriving into the villages. So there was an element of investment there, and it worked quite well. So people uh, got engaged with it. And and the question uh, bears an important factor. I mean, of uh, what are the actual costs? Um, we were interested on this strategy and, and saying that uh, can we sw can we shift the distribution of blood pressure and these are the means that we devised i don't think that 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 every single place should be using the same type of uh, activity i think i think if, if the activity or the target is to guarantee a full replacement and that was our target to guarantee a full replacement of this behavior of using a particular product regular sort of, and transitioning towards this, we had to uh, receive help from multiple ang angles. And it was uh, the door-to-door -door delivery and the, for, for the logistics, it was the community component, the sole marketing and, and, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the non-financial price of the exchange and making it available. But, what I'm trying to say is that not everybody should do the same now that we've proven the concept that is doable. I think, I think the targets and the next target should be is how do we guarantee that there is an entire shift towards these um, low, uh, low sodium, high potassium salts now that we've proven that, that it has benefits. Okay, two more questions. Do you see a way to promote this among street food vendors in urban areas? Can you imagine this being done effectively? Yes, and for them, again, it would be a different factor. They, they wouldn't care, um, with all obvious reasons, they wouldn't care about the health benefits. They are not selling food because of health benefits. They're selling food because it solves a quotidian problem people need to eat. And if they don't see, if they can afford it, it doesn't change the production of, I mean, it doesn't change their, their, their numbers. I mean, the, the cost of pr pr producing their food and it doesn't affect their sales, I think that they will be engaged. And uh, did you, in your study, track the consumption of uh, any foods that are sources of sodium or potassium? No, we had to be very pragmatic. We had to be in and out of the field and to be able to sustain repeated measurements over time and to have independent teams. We had, a, a, we had an intervention team and then we have a measurement team. We were not able to, to put a more granular detail on the consumption levels. Okay, that concludes our questions. This has been a very active session. I'll make some concluding comments after first uh, uh, Professor Miranda you do, and then, and then uh, Lindsay Joseph you do. I want to thank everybody for, for the opportunity of disseminating this strategy. I, I think what it's the, the, the fundamental learning from this is, is for us is like a, uh, uh, inviting us to look at the forest and not at the trees. I think on the cardiovascular prevention, we've been for years way too much focusing on the 
on individual trees and 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 this is a, like a shaker inviting us to see what else could be done and and i think by demonstrating this uh, modest benefit in blood pressure level but the shift in the distribution is a key message uh, that should uh, ignite further type of interventions what we have demonstrated in here is that it is feasible it is doable people are that people engage and people sustain this type of activity and we see the benefits over time and certainly variations of this type of intervention will be welcome but also uh, policies or different actors i mean uh, it, whether industry to produce more of it for cheaper, whether uh, through cookers, whether to give it to community kitchens for free or some, some sort of subsidy program will help and everything will help because of the principle of shifting this, the entire distribution of blood pressure with these type of strategies. So thank you there. Thank you, Dr. Miranda, for that excellent presentation. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining and a special thank you to our colleagues at PAHO for the simultaneous interpretation into Spanish. So let me just make a few concluding comments. First, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Miranda, for your work and for you joining us for this webinar. Thanks to PAHO for the interpretation and for facilitating. And I, I wanna step back for a moment. Resolve to Save Lives launched a little over two years ago. And we indicated at the time that three scalable interventions could prevent 100 million deaths from cardiovascular disease over a 30 year time period. And those are the global elimination of artificial trans fat, the improvement of hypertension treatment, and the reduction in sodium consumption in the population. Um, that estimate was validated in our article we published in recent months in the journal Circulation, we took that from a 30 year time frame to a 25 year time frame at the reviewer's request and documented a 94 million lives saved. Interestingly, both sodium reduction and hypertension treatment had a very similar impact, about 40 million lives saved each. And uh, there's a lot of attention on treatment of high blood pressure and we agree with that and we're focused on that. And we hope that will continue to improve after all, this is a treatment that has been standard of care in higher income countries for half century, and yet is out of reach for most people living with hypertension in lower income countries. And there is not any conflict between sodium reduction and hypertension treatment. In fact, they're quite synergistic. If you reduce sodium, your blood pressure will come down more with the same level of medications. Fewer people will need medications, um, but even if we're wildly successful with sodium reduction and even potassium improvement, uh, there will be around a billion people in the world who need treatment for hypertension. So we think both of these strategies are needed. Over the past two years, we've seen a lot of interest and progress in hypertension treatment. And we're optimistic that that progress will continue in the coming months and years. Sodium reduction has been in some ways more challenging. We have successful models uh, from Chile, where we have emerging evidence of front of pack warnings, from the United Kingdom also, and from China and South Korea and elsewhere. But it's an area that has gotten much less attention than hypertension treatment, even though the health benefits are equivalent among the two interventions. So anytime we hear that sodium reduction may be a lot of work, we have to remind people, so is treating hundreds of millions of people. Uh, both of these are very important uh, initiatives and uh, the various ways to reduce sodium, including by changing how people cook, by changing the incentives for companies that sell packaged goods, and by promoting low sodium, potassium enriched salts are all things that need to be further explored and most importantly, further implemented. So with that, thank you very much. This concludes our last Lynx webinar for 2019. We're scheduling webinars for 2020, and if people have ideas for topics they would like for us to cover, please uh, uh, suggest them. Uh, thanks to Lindsay Joseph and the team for coordinating these, and we wish you all the best to the end of the year, and look forward to uh, increasingly vibrant communications on the Lynx community website. Thank you all.